Welcome to the Honest Designer Show, your transparent look into life as a modern designer. My name's Tom and I'm the founder at designcuts.com and this week I'm joined by fellow Brit and expert hand letterer Ian Barnard, American retro design lover Dustin Lee and the incredibly talented South African illustrator Lisa Glanz. In this week's episode, we talk about the differences between designers and non-designers. Often, we can feel like we're speaking a foreign language when we're dealing with clients and other non-designers. However, there are definitely some effective ways to find common ground and articulate your design decisions in a more clear way. Let's get into the show. So this week we're talking all about non-designers, that strange species of people who (laughs) aren't obsessive over pixels, possibly aren't addicted to coffee and generally operate in a far more normal way probably than uh, most of us and our dear listeners. And I think it's interesting to dig into this this week because most people aren't designers, that's the whole thing. And so it's very easy for us to live in this bubble But really, when we start thinking outside, I think it can make our work better because we start thinking more about the end user and less about trying to impress some, I don't know, award design ceremony place or or our fellow designer online. You know, we start seeing the bigger picture. What do you guys think about this? Don't, Don't all jump at once. All right. <laughs> Dustin, you're looking you're looking most uh eager or least reticent at least. <laughs> I was feeling I was feeling the pressure from the silence. It was making me feel a strong urge. That was a, to that say was something. a deafening silence, wasn't it? It was. I, everyone I think was trying to be polite and let the other person sp- speak first. I could say I wasn't being polite, I just didn't I couldn't think of anything to say. I normally have to wait for someone to say something to uh, for my brain to start. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed you I noticed you tend to start slow and then you'll tend to warm up. And then you can't shut me up at the end. Yeah, (laughs) and then we we struggle to wrap the episode up when Ian gets going. Cool, so Dustin, what are your thoughts on non-design folk? Yeah, I think it's it's really important. I mean, there's, there's, there's vanity design that we do to impress people on Dribbble or to impress other designers. And then there's the design that actually helps people make sales in their businesses and their other things they're doing, whether it be a nonprofit or a business or a personal project on their on their part so yeah it's huge and i think there's not nearly as much emphasis i think even when we make stuff for non-designers it's easy to try to think about impressing designers as you make it yeah so it's an important topic i think oh you I think that so... never goes sorry no no no. i was just gonna say or you, or you 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 get so caught up in your the artistic side of it that you actually forget that you're designing for an end purpose you know that i find that people do often Mm-hmm. So you were saying, Ian? I was just saying that it never goes away. You know that sort of feeling of you want the cool people to like your work. <laughs> you know you want the cool people <laughs> yeah. to like you. And yeah. I think you know even from the school, you know the playground at school and stuff like that. You you there's that craving inside that you want you want non-designers to like your work, but you also want the designers to like your work. And you're sort of stuck in this middle thing where that mm. you know uh, being acknowledged that people like your work from people you respect is is something that you know i don't think there's many designers that don't feel that sort of sense of mm. being like a pat on the back by someone who's good at what they do um but then sometimes that's not your customer base or it's not who no. you're like you say who you're needing to uh, aim it to so it's uh, i think it's where your emotions get tied into the thing into mm. your job you know the weirdest element about the whole thing i always wonder is is Have you ever experienced, you know, that experience where a customer tells you what they want and it makes you cringe because it's just seems so horrible. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) But then at the same time, if you think about it, they know their business and their customers better than anyone. So they probably have some really good insights into what will actually work. Like I bought someone to get rid of the rodents in our house. We don't have rodents, but they have people come around that will help you prevent from getting rodents or bugs. Right. The design was not great, but it didn't matter. It it was better maybe that it was the way it was. So 
the point is well, it's clear yeah yeah the point is, is that the business does know to some degree i think like what is best even if it's not the most beautiful attractive thing sometimes i don't know i'm torn on that it, well i think it would, what makes you a great design is the fact that you're taking that you're taking the customer's knowledge of their business and how they're going to sell and you're adding you know your your design to it to make it to elevate it and that's what makes you a great designer you come you combining both um but where where designers be, get it wrong sometimes is that they're so hell bent on looking cool in their work that they actually forget to you know do the job mm-hmm. so so what does looking cool look like to you though what do you mean by that well i think um often i mean we all know that they're trends in designs uh, you know, in mm-hmm. in the whole design industry. So I think people, there's nothing wrong with following trends. I mean, that's a good thing. That's that's the way it is. But it's just that sometimes trends don't match a particular brand or a particular look or function. And I think people uh, are so caught up in trying to apply the latest trend that, that they actually lose perspective, um, you know, in getting the actual design across or getting the job done properly so uh, it's it's, as you said it's like an ego design or it's fulfilling your own need which is nothing wrong with because you still have to enjoy your job but you still need to balance the fact that you know it's got to it's got to do the work for for the actual client and 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 their business yeah yeah i agree I'll, i'll give you an example actually one of the biggest trends that i remember was the flat design trend oh yeah you you remember when that guy's hit Yes. When, when, yeah, when with, that hit with and those it was, shadows, those like flat well, shadows. that it evolved to that. So it started yeah. as like basic flat design, and then people started riffing off of that, and you got the forty-five degree shadows and that kind of thing. But it was everywhere, mm. absolutely everywhere. There were like sites dedicated to galleries of just flat design work, and every designer was trying it. And I got caught up in it as well because it was cool and it was refreshing, kind of working that simple. But I did find it restri- restrictive at points because I'd be doing some client work or something and the flat design look really wasn't appropriate for them at times. But Lisa, as you said, you're so stuck in working within that particular trend mm. and all your work is following that trend that suddenly, yeah, you, you get blinkered that it might not actually be the best fit for people. Yeah. Yeah. I I have a similar, I have a coffee shop down the road and the theme is Egyptian. It sounds really weird for coffee shop, but it's like an Egyptian themed coffee shop. (laughs) It works. It totally works and it's cool, but they hired someone to do some additional design work for them. And they did those like really classic faux retro round seals and, and banners and stuff like that. And for some coffee shops, I've seen it work really great. Uh, but for that, it was so weird because their whole theme was Egyptian before that. It made absolutely no sense. And mm. you feel like a good designer might have, you know, riffed off that. Ele- like like Lisa said, elevated that without going off in the way off in left field. Yeah. Yeah. And you probably find that designer was, was you know, he was having a retro month. Because, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you guys ever had that. <laughs> where you went through a phase in your work where it was like, oh, I just love this color. I've got to use it in everything. Or I just love this font. So I'm going to use it in everything. Well, ev- every month is a retro month for Dustin. That's what I was going to yeah. say. I named my shop Retro Supply. <laughs> so every yeah. month is that. Although, to be clear to anyone listening, lots of the stuff works plenty good yeah. for not doing retro stuff. Yeah. Can yeah. I... Could I say something about flat design just before we get off it? Go on. Um, one of my first products I ever released was a, a icon set of flat icons. Yeah. And um, which is so not your style. Sorry. It, it's really not your style. When I think about your style, that always seems really incongruous. Yeah, but that was before I did any Cliffy. Honestly, before I did Cliffy, I was the world's blandest designer. <laughs> 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 you, you had that I on like the business that card, right? Because, <laughs> like, I do like, and you can see what my stuff's like by going on to. Um... No, I don't want it. It sounds boring. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you're willing to share. It. Yeah, it's weird. No, go on. Where is it? <laughs> well, no, it's because I used to do stuff and give it away after Chris Spooner's advice, which Tom uh, rejected. <laughs> uh, don't bring that up again. Um, where I gave away stuff for free. Like I would just, I was like, whatever the trend was, I'd do my own <laughs> spin on it, and I'd give it away for free. So it would like be some patterns or some icons, and and it really worked. It worked for me because I got, I 
and it still gets like between twelve and sixteen thousand vi like visits to my ianbarnard.co.uk site where I just left them up there. There might be some shabby chic stuff. It was just I was just experimenting with like vectors and stuff like that. I would experiment with like flat design. And luckily, um, I'd moved on from the glossy Apple button icons. Yeah, was well, it skeuomorphic? I think it was called. Or something. Yeah, I like that stuff personally. Yeah, it was cool. I miss it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and the thing is, I I think it was it took an injection of the calligraphy to really amp up my design work. For some reason, I was just like a I felt like a middle of the road designer. I wasn't particularly cutting edge. Uh, I was just sort of following the trends. And it wasn't until I did calligraphy that suddenly like, boom, you know. Is it not because you discovered your own style? I don't know. I I um, I think because the letters were so beautiful that it took a, you know, it was harder to be cheesy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you yeah. know what I mean? Fair enough. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if you stick to... If you just stick to like one style of calligraphy, like copper plate, which is like elegant script, it doesn't look cheesy because yeah. it's a traditional um, look. And so you can, or, you know, a brush script or something like that, you know, mm. if, you look, if you stick to some of the, the, the foundational styles, it's not going to be cheesy because it's been around for, you know, however Whatever, long. For a reason, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not a fleeting trend. Um, I think... Just circling back, obviously, to non-design folk. Uh, no, no, but I think that that is actually all relevant because, um, as we said, the, the trends can be a bit more fleeting. And ultimately, clients and often the general public, they don't care about that stuff. No. And it's much no. the same as you get this in music, you get it in fashion. So someone who's really into the fashion industry, they're going to be hyper aware of like micro trends and stuff going out of style, you know, at 8.30 p.m., <laughs> on the 12th of June is when that item fell out of style. And the general public don't care about that stuff. Like, right. you know, they just want a top that's going to fit them or they want to look halfway fashionable. And and so I think it's great. Anything creative, like any medium like this, you need that extreme. You need the people who geek out about it and take it to absolute extremes. And then that kind of dilutes down to everyone else, right? Mm. So everyone is affected by design. Everyone has an awareness of it, mm. but they don't want to be thinking about it all day and worrying about all the ge geeky bits. They kind of leave that to people like us and then it will filter down to their life in a more diluted way or whatever. But I guess what I'm saying is all, all those micro trends and all those little details that we live and breathe don't even affect them for the most part or they're certainly not aware of it. The, the part about being not aware of it, I noticed so much. I... I remember seeing on, on Dribbble and other marketplaces and different places, all these things that seemed, I lived around them. They were all over, in particular, watercolors and hand lettering, which, by the way, I think it could be argued that hand lettering is a trend. I mean, I know calligraphy has been around forever, blah, 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 but hand lettering is clearly mm. this gigantic trend right now. But anyway, I, I, I digress there. But that stuff is just showing up in Target. I don't know. I think I think they, you said that they have Target over in the UK, but Tar Target. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But in Target, they just started to do some of the stuff we've been seeing for maybe a year and a half as designers. So yeah. when we talk to people and say, "Oh, you, you know, let's try this," they might be like, "What is that? I've never even heard of that," because we're ahead of the game, but to them, mm. we look insane. Yeah, and it, it filters down. So there's going to be parts of the design community who knew about this stuff way before we did. Mm. So oh, yeah. there will be some little origin point where it starts to take hold. Mm. Then it becomes saturated in the design community. Then it filters down to the real world. And then often cases it, it becomes saturated there. Where if, if hand lettering was everywhere or, or some particular style was everywhere, um, the general public would eventually get bored with that. Mm. But the design community would have got bored with it way earlier and they'd probably oh, yes. moved on to exactly. the next thing, which would then filter mm. down. So it becomes cyclical. Yeah, but, totally. Yeah, but there's nothing wrong with applying trains. It's just, I guess, going back to what we were originally saying, is that it, does it suit the brand? Does it suit the message? Does it suit the product? You know, so um, as, as much as we want to, as designers, we want to 
jump on that bandwagon of the trend and, and apply it. It's, you just have to be aware of, of, of who your audience is and, and where it's going and, and what job it's doing. I mean, it's it's wonderful having this really bold hand sort of, you know, like hand lettered font, um, you know, saying things are for sale. But then if you use that same font to describe what it is that's for sale and no one can read it, then, it's, then you've sort of missed the mark. You haven't done your job, you know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So kind of what we're circling around here is stop being so precious. You, yeah. you, you need to kind of pull from both directions. So like be pixel perfect and be precious in, in you know, loving the details, but don't be so precious about particular um, aesthetics and and styles and stuff like that. And I think an effective way for overcoming that that feeling of preciousness is to really listen to the client and really pay attention to the end user and when you start mm. seeing it through their eyes um, and kind of empathizing with their perspective, I think that makes you a better designer. When you are getting very precious about, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really feeling this particular type of font or I, I, I forget which one of you said it, but I, I've to- totally been there where I bought a new font and I've used it on everything. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's a great fit or not. I just can't yeah. stop using it. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and that's really not good design. Whereas if I actually um, really talked in depth with the client and got to understand their their side of things that would then dictate my decisions when it came to style and the fonts and tools that I was using for my work. Mm. Yeah. Just really quick, I feel an obligation as the guy from the states to have you have you define preciousness. I've never heard that term in the way you're using it. So what does that mean exactly? So I mean being precious like being overly um perfect no um yeah yeah kind of like god it's hard to pedantic (laughs) pedantic mixed with um yeah you sort of it's like you you're so attached to your work that that Mm. anything that that sort of gets in its way you become defensive and it's like your baby yeah yeah so so in this case you, you would be reluctant to deviate yeah. from what you're doing because because you've got very like precious and kind of you're, you're clinging onto it even if it's not the right fit i see okay yeah and i I'm, I'm not going like golem on you if that's what you're <laughs> thinking that would be cool though <laughs> yeah i'm not I'm, but it I actually is kind of like there. golem when you think about it because he's like the precious the precious is all he can think about <laughs> exactly a little bit yeah no no it is totally and uh, for, for anyone listening dustin just did a fantastic kind of uh, mannerism of Gollum there <laughs> clutching away at his design trend just my natural everyday look <laughs> uh, um so is, is there anything else um stepping away from trends maybe for a second i just wanted to think about the actual differences in mindset mm-hmm. because maybe that helps us to better understand not just our clients but as i say the end users and stuff and mm. i think it's something we don't talk about a lot like we do get into a bubble and we just think oh well we're we're used to our peers thinking like this and it's what we're in all day every day doing our work um and for me i i separate them so i've got my i've got designer tom who is very pixel perfect and meticulous and does all that stuff uh, and then i've got normal person tom who goes out with friends and doesn't really think or talk about design in some of those spaces but really when when I let let the two overlap and I think how little my friends know about design I don't know if it's the same for you guys like they 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 have no idea just like I don't really know their jobs yeah mm. <laughs> it's like when I talk about with my type design stuff how to explain it to um someone who doesn't really know type design which is quite a lot of people there's even more mm. people than design you know just you know people know about putting together a brochure or putting together a business card and they know roughly mm. how that when i say i design typefaces i get a sort of slightly blank face <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so then what i have to do is say so comic sans Arial, <laughs> times new roman yeah. i design stuff like that but for me, mine are more on trend stuff rather than an established, you know, uh, strong typeface like Comic Sans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> true, true. <laughs> oh, shame for Comic Sans is a classic. It's funny though, because I, so I don't make fonts, but I sell some fonts on Retro Supply. And when I tried to explain to like my brother in law, the best way I could explain it, I said, oh, well, we do textures, we do templates. He didn't understand. I said, well, we sell fonts. 
because I knew he knew what fonts were, of course. And then he like mouth stuff without actually saying it. He, you could tell that his like mouth was moving like he was thinking. And then he was like, but <laughs> why would anyone ever spend enough money for you to pay your bills to buy fonts? I like that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> which makes total sense because I remember before I was a designer, I would think people are really into fonts. <laughs> Doing an L yeah. on the forehead here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and they think, well, why wouldn't you just use Arial? Because right. that's free. <laughs> I, I posted I posted something the other day. My dad gave me uh, an old advert he'd produced, or he produced an advert, and he said, "Oh, could you?" get this into a format I can send to the magazine because he does, he sort of buys and sells rare cricket books. And the whole thing was done in comic sans. And, like, <laughs> and I was like posted it about being a type designer and my dad goes and uses uh, <laughs> uses comic sans. Bless him. Um, <laughs> Did you feel like this strong obligation to go and correct it? Well, yeah, I just reproduced the whole thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you couldn't let that go. Uh, wouldn't yeah, you? imagine you I'd know if I'd sent I'd send that out and I'd I said like I'd put this together <laughs> with my name on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but, so, are, are, are there any other clear differences? Do you think? Yeah, you know, uh, well, I don't know if this is directly related to this topic, but um, I think sometimes designers maybe it is they get a bit precious about the kind of work that they take on that it has to always be. Um, like funky, if I can call it that. Um, but there's there's nothing wrong with those very straightforward kind of um, foundational design jobs. They actually mm -hmm. put your mind into perspective to the end user. For example, when I first started my freelance business and I was kind of open to taking just about anything, I actually did a little bit of catalog work. And that you you can't go you can't go to town on that you have. Oh, to I thought be... you were talking about modelling work. No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so diverse. Yeah. Oh no, you never brought up this before. <laughs> uh, wouldn't that be funny? Did, um, did you just gaze no. into the distance and that, that kind of thing? <laughs> you know your cover for this for this episode, right? You know the your social media image you have to do. <laughs> Oh my goodness, that would be funny. Yeah, so <laughs> it it kind of teaches you to to think about like when someone's getting this piece of paper or book or whatever, it's it's got to be really clear what it is that you you know telling them like the price and the product and the this and the that and and I think um, designers need to really put themselves into the shoe of the end user and uh, and um that's if if you're struggling to do that that would be a great way to do is like really do a mundane simple run of the mill foundational kind of design job it helps can i put it i'll put an example on top of it that yeah. i think applies to it so i'm not into coding or developing at all i could care less about how it works i just wanted to get the job done so my brother is a software engineer so i'll tell him I need something that does this. Do you know anything that does this? Or can you make this happen, for instance, with something like, you know, Buffer to send out your social posts? And he might be like, well, I don't know. The security isn't super great on that part. And and it does this and it like pulls the files from here and executes JavaScript, blah, blah, blah. I don't even know like technical stuff to code, <laughs> but something like that happens and he'll start to really get into it. And I'm like, I don't care. All I care about is that will it send the thing on time when I put it in? Yeah. And I think for a lot of business owners, they feel that way about the design. They're like, mm. I don't care why you picked this. Like, I just am trying to cut people's lawns and like, I really need something that says yeah. I cut lawns. That's all. Like I want to exactly. deal with it once and be done with it and move on with my life. Precisely, yeah. Actually, what I really struggled with um, when I was doing when I first started freelance design and I was doing a lot of local clients is that they wanted like 200 business cards designed, you know, logo printed for like 50 quid, and so they didn't they didn't realise, I suppose, all that goes into it, and I suppose there's that that clash of um, what we do as a job and what people think we do as a job sort of thing. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. Um, and just coming off the back of like that sort of not people not knowing what we do. That, that, goes, goes, for, that goes for anything though. It's like I've known uh, wedding photographers and people always go, can't believe you charge that much. You're only at the wedding for three hours. 
you must have the best hourly rate ever. And it's like, well, no, because most of my time goes into editing the photos yeah. and like post production stuff and dealing with the clients and the thousand other aspects there are to being a photographer. And people never see really behind mm. just that that outcome. Like when you when you go to the theatre, you you might really enjoy the spectacle, but I guarantee you're not really thinking about like the months and months of preparation no. and script rewrites and people working on the lighting and geeking out over every tiny detail. Oh yeah, for sure. Like when you watch a TV show, you watch it for 45 minutes and you're like, that was great. And you don't realize they've been writing and re-editing it and all this stuff for months. Like 45 yeah, minutes but- is done. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but to, to go on that, to, to continue with that example, those people are always thinking of the experience of the audience. So as designers, we should be doing the same. You know, you got to think of the experience of the end user. Yeah, I... I- I think it comes down to communication because the world needs people who are this geeky about design, Mm. but the world doesn't need to understand it or even care. Mm. They enjoy the simplistic outcome and they wouldn't enjoy the outcome if all the geekiness hadn't gone into it. But like Dustin said with the programmer example, like they they don't need to know why would they is. So if I go and get my car fixed, I don't really care how they did it or every detail. I'm hopeless with that. I just want my car that fixed. That's true. <laughs> yeah. If they if they did explain how they fixed my car, I probably would never go back. <laughs> <laughs> uh. But so I, this kind of brings something interesting up for me because Ian was talking about that low price for buying for getting the cards or whatever, and I can picture someone saying, especially if you I keep using this grass example, but let's say you're a grass cutter again because that's what I've been saying. There's a builder being uh, chucked out. Of this yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The builder's what gone. To the builder? Just any local type of business where design maybe is not at the forefront of their mind. What What's the argument or what do you think is the best argument a designer can use as to why they shouldn't just use one of these constantly emerging companies that have tons of pre-built logos and they have mass produced stuff that just pulls it all together for you? I have a good answer for this. Yeah, okay, you go. Go on, everyone wants to go. Uh, (laughs) Lisa, I think you you were first. I'll I'll save my answer. Lisa, I think. Uh, Well, I was just, mine's quick. My my most obvious and quickest answer would be then it's not designed specifically for you and your business and and tailor-made to reach the right person. That that sounds like a sensible one, so I'll come back with this one. Go on in. (laughs) I, because if if they if this is what they expect, they're not gonna then go. Oh, you've convinced me to spend, you know, twenty times more to get you on board and to do it. You know instantly they think, okay, that just point them to you know whoever it is, moo.com, That's where you want to go, and then just move on to the next client you're gonna do it for. Because um, because mm. the, the amount of time if you're gonna do it for a really cheap price. The amount of time you spend is just not worth it. So you either have to, uh, you know, say what Lisa says and see if they respond. Most of the time, when I said that, they they wouldn't respond in a pro, you know a positive way. So you just you maybe give them two options. Say you can either spend some more with me and get a quality product, or go here at the website and it does it all for you uh, mm. from a template and just give them that honest option. Um, and you'll know who you're dealing with if they come back to you or not. Yeah, um, I've talked to a lot of small businesses when I was freelancing more and oftentimes I would actually recommend the cheap option because I think it's what's best for their business. Mm. And truthfully, as designers, we should only do the work when it is going to benefit them. And I've talked to so many people, they're like, I'm just starting out, I'm barely turning a profit. And some people who perhaps have come from money have actually been on the fence about going and chucking like five grand or something at a website and I have to try and have some integrity and say look you haven't even made a sale yet Mm -hmm. like go here spend a hundred bucks get a website up tomorrow and focus on growing your business come back to me in a year or two if you're like you know getting steady business and then I'll help you take it to the next level but you shouldn't try and please people to get a load of money if it is Bob the builder down the road and he's got one van and he just needs 
any kind of logo on the side of his van that says I'm Bob the Builder, then it really is not going to matter a huge amount if he gets it from 99 Designs or if he gets a bespoke logo. It's really not going to affect his business very much. Mm. I love that. I love that because I, I think it. I think it's so true and so smart. We've all talked before on different episodes about how you just need to get out and get started with something when you're starting a project, whether it yeah. be a self-initiated project. And I think for new business owners, it's very much the same like you're saying, Tom. Sometimes, like you said, they just need to spend a little bit of money to get the basic things to get up and going. Once they start to make some income and justify that they have a sustainable idea, then maybe you go back and you really start to hone in, like Lisa's saying, and, you know, onto that very specific audience that you want to get. But in the beginning, you kind of just need to get up and going sometimes. Hmm. and Definitely. justify the idea with by making sales completely um my real answer for the question was to actually show results um which is not always measurable so if it is uh you know you build a friendly in he he's not really going to be able to measure that too successfully but i found it so easy when people said well why do you charge that I actually had a client who ran an online membership course um, and taught taught music and, and that kind of thing. And he was doing really well. I think he was doing like 5K a month or, or, or something pretty good. And then he implemented my redesign and overnight increased signups and I think revenue by like 50% or oh, something. Wow. It, it was like a staggering instant jump up. And that becomes pretty easy to sell when people are like, well, why should I pay that much? It's like, because you'll yeah. make your money back in a month. Yeah. Like, that's why. <laughs> like, it's, an, it's a no that. brainer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And pretty I much think, sells itself. Yeah, yeah. I think you can find that stuff as well. And I'll give you another example of that. So, um, Matt, who is our creative director and runs his design agency, he's been tweaking conversion stuff on their agency website. Um, and seeing how it performs. And it's been doing better and better and better and attracting more and more leads when he's actually started putting that stuff at the forefront where it's results-driven. It's mm-hmm. like, we took them from here to here. They were doing this. We increased this by 30%. Like, here's how their ben- business benefited. That very black and white stuff is, is awesome because clients see that, they're like, yeah, I want that for my business. Yeah. Instead of like, oh, okay, so you're going to geek out and give me all this fancy-looking design and good for you, but I don't really care about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to benefit them. So um, are there any other kind of idiosyncrasies with people? So we've kind of covered that we're all fancy and, and we're snobby about this stuff and we, and we kind of look, <laughs> l- look down and laugh at the the non-design bits and Comic Sans and every, everything. Yeah. Um, I, I do think, because I remember we did a lot of research um, and brainstorming. When we started Design Cuts, we started thinking about our ideal type of community member and we kind of pulled all our favorite things about designers into one and had this little um, hypothetical character who I think we called Timothy. Um, and uh, <laughs> and we, we assigned all these characteristics to him. And it was stuff like um, being very meticulous, being very pixel perfect, um, almost a little bit OCD yeah. in what you're doing. Do Aren't you guys all... find that non-designers don't seem to have that to the same extent? No, they don't. I don't think. Well, definitely not in, in the, this kind of field. I mean, I suppose, I mean, I have friends that are, are OCD in their jobs, but it's not design. Um, mm-hmm. But, I mean, I, I, I've numerous times we've gone oh wow look at that so beautiful the label on this and that or whatever and <laughs> and cliffs looked at me like what are you what are you on about <laughs> <laughs> i didn't see anything different between that one and that one i'm like geez <laughs> man god isn't it obvious <laughs> but yeah so people just don't get it if they're not in it i think <laughs> it's a whole it's that it's that whole new car thing right where you when you notice the when you're looking for a new car you notice the car everywhere it's like that as a designer when you're a designer you notice the design everywhere yeah yeah you you, you really do um are, are there any other traits and the reason i'm kind of pushing um to get this from you guys is because i think by understanding the differences in mindset it really will help some of the listeners to you know react better with their clients and and be better designers in general there's something that i think there's a huge opportunity for so often the goal is to do work for 
really cool, cool companies, t-shirt companies or cupcake companies or coffee companies or whatever that might be. And I think there's a missed opportunity in all of these much more mundane customers that need things. Oftentimes people feel like, oh man, I have to do this to pay the bills this month. But there's so many cool opportunities there that are missed. And if you just change your perspective and realize it might not be doing the latest trend when I do this, but I have a really fun opportunity to do something amazing and it can be just as deep and insightful and all engrossing and enjoyable and fulfilling to do. Mm. Especially if you take it to the next level that they're not used to. I mean, just... An example of what you're just saying is my biggest client that I had for many, many years, um, I started out doing a really mundane job for them. It was it was kind of like a really boring medical um, newsletter, but I still applied, you know, as much as I could um, of my own design skill and experience to, just to elevate. It's something that they would never have expected but obviously still keeping within the target market and and they were so blown away they started giving me more work and I mean 10 15 years later I was I was their main designer and, and then they literally you know I was they were my biggest client so um yeah you, you can't knock those as I was saying earlier you can't knock those kind of like foundation jobs I mean they they're important you know they, they teach you so much and as you said Dustin it's kind of like opens your there's opportunity. There's definitely opportunity, especially if you elevate it, especially. Right. Mm. Instead of fighting for that one little area that everybody wants, there's just yeah. this wide open opportunity here. Exactly. That's cool. I like that. So I've got a question. How do you balance your geekiness with a normal person's lack of caring? <laughs> that's, that's the best <laughs> question. <laughs> seriously how, uh, how do you do that i think I you think mean you, in co- sorry. Yeah, sorry go no 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 i think if you uh take your i suppose step out of the equation that it's all about you in between the client and the customer you know whatever that may be and you step back and you're not like the complete middleman but you're the i suppose person bringing together like a date of the yeah. client and the customer. Yeah, like a conduit. Yes. Yeah. And, and and removing yourself from that situation so that you don't get too involved in that. I think it, it's the emotional thing. If you could turn that off, then you would just go, okay, this is what needs doing. I'll do it. And without the sort of, I um, need to do it like this because I'm cool or trendy or because mm. it'll get me noticed on this and stuff like that. That all kind of springs out of the emotional side. So if you can just sort of turn that off by putting yourself out of that situation and just saying the this is what needs to be done mm-hmm. to help the client connect with the customer, then hopefully that will give you a better perspective and 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 do the things like we've just been chatting about, you know, sort of mm. more mundane stuff or, you know, getting excited over a project that seems boring at the start but may turn interesting as you think of it in a logical way to get you know, customer to client, client to customer, mm. if that makes Especially, sense. Yeah, it does. Especially if you if you start looking at the importance of whatever it is that you're designing for the customer, I mean, the, your client. So if, if it's like, if it's their actual brochure, their product brochure selling, I don't know, particular size bolts to the, I don't know, <laughs> train industry. <laughs> I mean, that Ooh, sounds tell pretty me more. boring. But <laughs> tell me more. This sounds like an interesting business. <laughs> Um, you know, you've got to, especially if you start really analyzing the value of that particular project to that company uh, and it's about customer service. So you want to, you want to give the best possible service to that customer of yours so that they can achieve their business goals, you know? So you got to put yourself out of the equation. I know it's difficult sometimes, but yeah, you have to. To piggyback on that. Do you guys ever see it? Man, we keep doing this, this episode. Off to you, man. (laughs) Sorry. Uh, To piggyback off of that, a tip that I've heard a lot that I've always found useful is if you're working for a certain client, like say they're making very specific size bolts to fit into manufacturing, (laughs) go to forum, you know, go to forums. This is really common, but great advice. Go to forums where those people hang out and read how they talk and read what they're concerned about and read what they think about. Good point. I I guarantee you'll find they're not talking about the great design of the uh, bolt packaging. (laughs) 
But you might <laughs> find that here's a concern of theirs and here's something I can talk about that they will be interested in about the packaging because maybe we can emphasize this. Maybe we can yeah. fit more bolts into a box, yeah. saving them shipping time if we design this part of it. So I think mm. that looking through forums of what they're doing can be very useful or looking where they hang out at what they actually talk about. And actually going off that, going into the store and acting as a customer because you're like, I know, I know nothing about bolts. And so going into a store and going, okay, I need to find some bolts. What's helped me? And you think, okay, I can't see instantly on this packaging what size that bolt is. Yeah. Or I can't see if it's the right bolt for me. You know, so you think you have to think, <laughs> okay, I'm the I'm now the customer and I want to buy these bolts, but it's not making it easy. How can I make yeah. it easy for me as a customer? Exactly. You know, not that you're going to buy the bolts because you... Yeah, but bolts, then the job but, becomes exciting sure. because it's a challenge. Yeah, because you're like, okay, I'm going to nail it with... Yeah. This packaging with the bolts. Great pun. <laughs> that Great was pun, a good though. pun, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you absolute nut. But you're right, though, because I, I think I think if you did go and pretend to be a customer like that, or even be a customer, and then you went to your client and talked to them and said, I went to the store, I needed these bolts to put this door up. Here's 10 things that were super annoying to me about the bolts I saw in the stores. I guarantee you that person is going to listen to and hang on every word you have to say about Absolutely. using bolts yeah. to hang up a door. And that's going to get yeah. you that much closer to giving them a good solution and getting them as a client. Yeah, completely. And I really, I want to elaborate on this because, um, as I said, this is something we did a lot at the start of Design Cuts. And we went in stores looking for bolts. <laughs> yeah, like nonstop. <laughs> the seven millimeter, the nine millimeter, just every bolt imaginable. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it was um no it, it, it's so good doing this uh for clients like dustin you seriously hit the nail on the head just three years ago. <laughs> oh my goodness um because uh, <laughs> they can't but, all right I, l let me give you an example okay so you're you're a designer and you're doing a design for a coffee company and imagine if you had no uh knowledge at all about coffee or coffee drinkers and you're a designer. Is this, uh, Tom, you're being unrealistic. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I really am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you're, you're, from, you're from some mythical island where they don't have coffee and you've grown up and, and you're not familiar with it. And, and this is your first client and you've moved to England and it's a coffee company. So to you, it looks like some brown liquid in a cup and it could be anything. And you don't know about the intended client. You don't know any of that. And you're going to miss out on so many key things like coffee drinkers. They can often be kind of snobby about it, like in a geeky way, right? Yeah, Same as designers. Yeah. Like they, they can really geek out over their coffee. Uh -huh. um, you know, they love like the aroma of it and get really into all of that. They like their kind of home brewing and get fancy and spend money on equipment with that kind of stuff. They're often addicted to it. So they're drinking tons of the stuff. All of that is context. And that's like tip of the iceberg. And you get that kind of stuff for every single client. And you can get really specific, like that's just how they relate to the product. But for example, with designers, when we audience mapped all this stuff, we saw some really interesting traits. Like for example, they're often kinder than most people. They can have empathy. Often they have family values and, and that kind of thing. And it's yeah. kind of like the f they often reject like the corporate world um, and can be a bit of a free spirit and, you know, a bit whimsical with some of them. And Obviously, that's not every designer, um, but you, you can start painting these broad strokes of a stereotype. And mm. uh, for example, if you if you were trying to target a design at designers, you wouldn't make it like Mr. Sleazy in a suit corporate sales guy like that would turn <laughs> off pretty much every designer. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you that just offer come... free coffee and you, you sort it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Like that, that all comes down to understanding and empathizing with your audience though and mm. empathizing in most cases with people who aren't designers, which is kind of the whole point of this episode. And I would really advocate going as deep as possible um, on that. Can I ask you a question about that, Tom? Mm-hmm. So I had mentioned like looking in the forums or doing something like that, but I think you're really good at this. Can you give other suggestions for how people might easily gather intelligence for clients <laughs> about their customers i love that it sounds like something the cia would do yeah <laughs> um well we we didn't need to do a ton of research because we were all designers right so 
we we knew ourselves and more than that we'd just been immersed in the community for years and years and years collectively as a team so the first thing i would do would be to talk to your client because if they're any kind of business person they should know their customers so it's like these are the people who you care about and you serve every single day with whatever your product is can you tell me as much as possible Um, and we we had the episode on getting feedback on your design work i'd use some similar methodologies there where you're trying not to be leading but you're trying to give them enough direction that they don't falter and and just get into a real like insightful um conversation and that will make you look really good and thorough and professional in the service you're providing and kind of take it a step further yeah um and it will give you fodder to kind of um explain to them when you're presenting your end designs here's why i did this it's because you told me your customers like this kind of thing or think in this mm. kind of way or see the world through these goggles that's why i've made the design like this yeah brilliant that. That, that's something i don't um there is a company called audio based in the bay area in california and they do design for everything from designing shopping carts to designing fonts to all sorts of things and one of the very first things they do i saw this special where they were doing shopping carts they just went to stores and pushed shopping carts around and used them in all sorts of different scenarios <laughs> and documented their frustrations and then watched other people push shopping carts around and watched when they had trouble <laughs> going around corners or watched when the wheel would you know get stuck sideways and they just made notes of all these things and it's such a common sense thing i think when someone tells it to you but it's so easy to forget that just by observing mm. you're like you're saying how just by observing their customers or by listening to what they say about their observations you can learn so many things that are just these obvious things that other people have missed that can and help it's them. fun right it, and and look for the weird stuff um look for the little idiosyncrasies and commonalities where you just didn't expect it and mm. crossovers it's like oh i didn't realize that you know all drinkers of this brand of coffee also seem to have an affinity for dungeons and dragons for some reason <laughs> totally. like, I, I i never would have expected that but um i i would say as well maybe go uh and get involved in facebook groups because there's a facebook group for virtually everything mm, i'm guaranteed there's idea. probably like the the bolt geek facebook group <laughs> and that is a group i will never be entering but um <laughs> you know that people set up groups around all kinds of weird like hobbies and stuff like that um, and, and that's where you want to go because I feel like these people are at the extremes of whatever this product is. Like designers go to extremes with their geekiness, right? Mm-hmm. So you, you don't want a kind of vanilla, like tepid uh, fan of this product. You want the people who live and breathe this kind of thing and geek out over it in their private little bubble where they're away from the rest of the world, you know? Yeah, and, and you'd be surprised because they all have this, like, you know, we could probably discuss the finer points of why, you know, what the beautiful parts about CS6 that we miss so much compared to CC or, or something mm. really dorky that no one in their right mind will <laughs> hear about except for maybe us. But the yeah, same thing Lisa's happens partner, in other things. He loves like, his stuff. Like, I remember making, I made a glitch pack for Retro Supply and I, I looked through Reddit forums on glitch, on, on glitch art and glitch music. There is a deep, deep, subculture into glitch stuff i mean crazy people are getting <laughs> photographs and they're turning photographs into like or turning music into photograph bitmaps and adjusting the bitmaps and putting them back in crazy stuff you wouldn't know existed so you'd be surprised if you like just under the surface every mm. industry has its craziness you know what i mean i love those little subcultures i find them so interesting yeah, yeah. it's it is it's they're, crazy they're, they're really self-contained unless you go digging for them like this you'd have no idea they're there right Mm. yeah to are. chuck in a, an analogy is that if you treat it like a tribe you wouldn't just enter a, a tribe just going yeah it's look it's me i'm really trendy Whoa, noise 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 <laughs> ray ray music you you would get to know the culture or the tribe before you would enter it you know what you can and can't do um what is uh best practices what is um uh, you know how how they you know how they eat how you know all those things that make yeah. them different Who and you are. would mm. you would you know you know, i suppose you'd immerse yourselves in it so you get a better understanding of who they are um so that they're more likely to trust the product the logo whatever that may be mm. um, because it, that's what in the end people buy because they trust the product and so you're building that trust by knowing the audience 
the tribe so well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that. I, I'll, I'll give you another quick analogy. It's like when filmmakers turn um, comics and stuff like that into a movie and you get all the diehard hard fans who are like, oh no, you've ruined it. And the general public have no idea that they've kind of masked this sacred uh, original <laughs> n- narrative or something. It's so true. Yeah. But yeah, pe- people care about the details. Yeah. For sure. Well, it even happens in movies where there's designers, you know, might be like to my wife or something. That's never how they'd actually do it. That's not real. <laughs> so silly. But but actually, that's a good analogy because sometimes there's this uh, pull from both sides where it's like doing it like the fans want it and doing it like the people supplying the money. And yeah. so you're like torn in between is mm. that, you know, if I, if I do it this way, then I'll get loads of love from this community. If I do it this way, then I'll get paid. So <laughs> you're like stuck in the middle. Of, yeah. You know, and, that, and I suppose one side is emotion, one side is, you know, brain, you know, is in mm. a, you know, business sense. And so it's, it's mm. that, yeah. It's, Finding it the balance. Of, yeah. It's kind of how the CEO for Starbucks had talked about there's a theater to many things. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Question is, would you have the courage to create a design which other designers thought was hideous if it was perfect for the end user? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you answer yes. that pretty quickly. <laughs> well, that question. I'd do it. I, I, would, I, I'd do I it, agree. But I wouldn't post it in my Instagram feed. <laughs> well, you know what it is? Our jobs as designers are to make something easy to either understand or to buy or to i mean if that's our job isn't that why we're doing this so actually <laughs> actually know. actually the job is slightly changing because half of my job is entertaining which is not something a designer <laughs> no, well that's self that's self-inflicted but yeah True. <laughs> and you're entertaining designers for the most part or letters yeah, and not client people to be clients. i suppose for me Half of my job, which I don't actually get paid for, but I'm thinking it's a job, um, is people who say, thank you for posting this. I really enjoy your videos. Hmm. And, you know, at some point, I'm hoping I can get paid for that. But, you know, (laughs) with that, I'm not selling anything. I'm just entertaining. And so it becomes a sort of... um, Yeah, it's a weird thing. But Ian... Please promise me that you will start ringing up pen companies and saying I'm an influencer. Yeah. Oh, that Jesus sounds so. Like, that's. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm an I'll give you. I'll give you some tips how to do that cold calling. <laughs> well, maybe yeah. you can. Maybe you can masquerade as my uh, head of promotions. Your, yeah, your agent. <laughs> I, okay, seriously, like, I yeah, I this needs to happen. There are so many influencers who are making a living yeah, I don't doing understand. the stuff they love who have smaller mm. followings with less engagement than you. I agree. It's wrong. Okay. This, is turn- yeah. that, this is turning into another how can we build in uh, <laughs> business. <laughs> we did this last week. I did, I, I, did make, I did make some money from the last call we made. So uh, there you go. <laughs> well, we're all rooting for you, buddy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, so so that, I think... I think um, design has changed you know with one of the obvious ones for all of us is like products you know when i first started you know selling design assets wasn't a um wasn't a thing you know there wasn't that opportunity there was a small you know where you'd get like you'd buy as a design agency a box of cut out images you know a thousand cut out images and you'd use about two of them um you know like an orange or something like that and I suppose that was on a really low scale. But now anyone can set up a shop. They can sell physical goods. They can sell digital goods. Um, they can have a YouTube channel. You know, that that's a different type of, I suppose, selling. It's, you know, selling to an audience via entertaining them. And you get the, I suppose, sales from, uh, you know, the revenue of the sponsorship or whether it's the adverts that play on your video. So I think... I think it's changed quite a lot how from just being a client customer 
it's still that process, but I think the customer has become lots of different people and the client oh, yeah. has become lots of different people. So. Well, and the interesting thing is even for not designers, but for other industries, entertaining people is a great way, I think, to to get customers. If you're selling bolts, I think there's entertaining ways to showcase your <laughs> bolts to the uh, the bolt consumers <laughs> of the world. But maybe I should try click free, click free with bolts. Yeah. <laughs> I have a feeling that's really going to happen. <laughs> I, I don't know where we've got the bolt example from this episode, but it is <laughs> truly bizarre. Um, okay, so to, to wrap up, I think really it's a case of not, not being too snobby, um, certainly not when you're dealing with the general public, thinking about the end user, just trying to empathize, get to know them, do your research, get inside their head. Like Ian said, get to know their tribe and it will just it will make you better in terms of your work it will make you better at dealing with your clients it will make you better at communicating why you've made the decisions you have and it will just get you away from all that kind of super geeky following trends overthinking it caring too much about the stuff where most other people don't it's like yeah you can do that in your own bubble but realize there's a, you know there's a line where we care about this stuff but other people don't and and that's totally fine Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode. We hope that it showed you some great ways to communicate your ideas and enthusiasm to non-designers. As always, you can find full show notes over at honestdesigners.com or find us over on iTunes by searching for The Honest Designers Show. If today's episode helped you, then it would mean the world to us if you took just a moment to leave us a quick review over on iTunes as this is one of the best ways for other creative folk to discover the show. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next week right here on The Honest Designers Show.